Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yes. So this is lovely and cozy. Yes, we have 100% we have a, a real fire behind us here, uh, mm -hmm. cautious of the uh, internet. So Simon, um, just sort of a, uh, this is going to be sort of a brief uh, exploration of Simon's history with Django and how it came about and sort of your history at, at Launch Journal World. But like, tell us how you started with the Launch Journal World. Like, how did you come to be, even be at the, so the company? So this is um, back in 2003. Um, so I'm sure everyone here has heard Django started at a small, small town newspaper in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, so this was 2003, and I was uh, a year into my degree at university. My, um, my girlfriend at the time had decided to take a year off, uh, well, a year in industry, which is an optional part of our degree course, um, and so had most of my friends. So I was sat there thinking, well, my girlfriend's running off to Germany for a year, and my friends are all quitting, so I now stand the, stand the opportunity of um, graduating a year before everyone else I know. Um, or I could try and find myself a, a year in industry as well. So um, at the same time, uh, this was back in the age of weblogs. Do you remember those before, um, before Twitter and Facebook and all of that? And um, I'd been reading the weblog of this guy, Adrian Halavati, who was a developer in America working for this Kansas newspaper, who it turned out shared a lot of my opinions on how you should make websites and so on. And he posted a job ad saying, hey, I'm looking for someone to join me at the Lawrence Journal World newspaper. So I dropped him an email and said, this thing, would it work as a one-year internship instead of a full-time gig? And um, he said, yeah, we could get that to work. So a bit of visa finagling and so forth. And I found myself on a plane to Lawrence, Kansas, to spend 12 months um, living without a car in, in the Midwest, which was <laughs> mostly fine. Um, and yeah, uh, so I moved out, moved out to, moved out to Kansas, and, and spent the next twelve months working with Adrian at the newspaper. So, so when you started at the LG World, you and Adrian both PHP developers, is that right? Yeah, we both, um, we both spent, we were both like pro professional PHP developers. We'd built all sorts of things in it, and we'd both got frustrated where we'd hit that point where our projects were getting com complicated enough that we were spending more time battling the language than. Than working with it. And at the same time, this is back when Mark Pilgrim was publishing Dive into Python, and um, there was a bunch of really interesting material out there about Python as a programming language. You know, coming from PHP, which isn't really a, a programming language that was designed so much as one that kind of um, coagulated together. Uh, with the, the idea of building web stuff in Python was really tempting. Right. Um, the problem was that there were at the time, there was a sort of mini explosion in web frameworks and libraries and things, but none of them were really the way we thought websites should work. I mean, the two big ones when we started looking to Python were, I think, Webware and Kyoto were two of the most popular options at the time. Oh, and Zope, obviously. And they all they did weird things like um, the URL path was directly mapped to functions and classes and stuff. So if you wanted to do nested subdirectories, you had to do really weird things. And they mixed get and post data together as a convenience for you. And generally, none of them were really the way we wanted to work. And we knew which bits of PHP we liked. We liked dollar underscore get and dollar underscore post and the, um, the, way, and the way it could handle cookies and headers and so forth. And you can still see that in, in uh, Django today. That's exactly, yeah. The, the, Django, um, the Django get, post, and request things are lifted directly from PHP. Django's, ti uh, Django's time fil formatting function is famously a ripoff of the PHP one because who needs localization and stuff anyway? <laughs> Um, only with one addition, because we worked for a newspaper, Adrian was very keen on sticking to associated press style, which is why the AM is A dot M dot, which is incredibly infuriating. You know, I always have to do the uppercase, uppercase one and pipe it through lower because I don't want to use associated press style for my, um, my date times. So tell us more about the sort of the world, the context which Django came about. Like, what was like? How was like CSS and HTML looking at this point? Like, well, this was um, so yeah. This was this was back in 2003. Web standards were this new exciting thing, and people were like trying to demonstrate that you could actually use CSS to do to do more than just get rid of the underlines on links. And so we were very keen on. And both of us were very much into semantic HTML and CSS, and this stuff was all extremely sort of forward thinking back then. And it's another thing that came up with the existing web frameworks is that, you know, they'd try and generate big chunks of HTML as a convenience for you. They'd expect you to be, be, be using um, tables for layout and so on. So we wanted, so a lot of Django's initial stuff was just, we want to build proper semantic markup and we want to be able to generate RSS feeds correctly and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, I mean, so, so what was the environment inside the LG world that like, because like, you know, at this point, 
going to a manager saying, oh, make a new web framework sounds like a ridiculous idea. Like, yeah, how we did you didn't. sell that? So we, 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 Django was not a web framework until after I left the journal world. I was there for right. a year. Um, about eight months after I, the last thing I did when I was there was hi, um, help to hire Jacob Kaplan Moss, which was probably my, my biggest contribution <laughs> in a way. Um, but yeah, so uh, about eight months after I'd left, they got approval to open source it. And, uh, but back when I was working on it, it was called The CMS because naming things is really difficult. And um, Django, it wasn't a web framework. It was actually designed as an abstraction layer between our code and Mod Python because we didn't know if we trusted Mod Python. You know, we were looking at how do you serve Python applications. And back then, there weren't that many answers for it. And there was this Mod Python thing which looked sort of okay, but it was very, the API was very specific to Mod Python. And the, the worry we had is we'd build a bunch of stuff on Mod Python and discover that it, was, it sucked. And now we'd, we'd have a bunch of code we couldn't use anymore. Right. So the request and response functions and, and the, the, the request object and, and so forth was originally just to wrap around Mod Python. So if we needed to swap it out, we'd be able to. And this is before Whiskey as well. Whiskey actually um, spun up a couple of years later. Uh, that we, we were involved in a mailing list called the Web SIG, the Web SIG mailing list on, um, to help try and standardize uh, a way for doing this stuff. And I think we, we threw our request and response objects at the mailing list, and people were like, yeah, it doesn't handle streaming bodies and things very well. And that was the end of that. Right. But, but you know, in that sense, like, to what point do you think Django was sort of inspired the, Python, the other, Python, other Python web frameworks that came afterwards? I mean, there's a lot of similarities. That's a really interesting question. So I've not had the right kind of conversations with the founders of various other frameworks to really know that. I mean, Flask and stuff are very clearly influenced. And I believe WebOB was, like Flask was influenced by WebOB. I'm right. pretty sure WebOB was influenced by the Django request response cycle. Um, but as to other aspects, I mean, Django itself stole ideas from everywhere. The templating language was mostly lifted from Smarty, which is a PHP templating language, with a few ideas that we borrowed from Cheetah. Um, I think template inheritance came from Cheetah, okay. off the top of my head. Um, and you know, like I said, lots of features in Django came from, from the Python world. And I know as Django has evolved, it's pinched ideas from Rails, and Rails has pinched ideas from Django, and so on. Yeah. Well, okay, so, so, so sort of as you're developing the CMS inside mm -hmm. the LJ world, like, what, what is the process like? like you know, yeah, how do you start with that kind of process? So I should go back to the, the point of how did we convince our boss to let us do this thing? And um, there was, it was a very small team. I mean, until I, before I arrived, Andrew, uh, Adrian was the back-end developer, and he was just the whiz kid who wrote all the code. Nobody really cared how he was doing it. And he'd been built, and the Lawrence Journal world for was an incredibly forward-thinking organization for a small-town newspaper. It was doing really exciting stuff. It was the first, or one of the fir very first local newspapers in the US to put the, start putting stuff online, you know, actually say, we're going to publish the entire newspaper online. So they'd been doing that for a few years, and they had a custom Perl content management system that, that they were doing that with. Um, Adrian had been building stuff in PHP, and the, the sort of crown jewels of the journal world was the site called Lawrence.com, which was a sort of entertainments and sort of entertainments news and listing site for the town of Lawrence, Kansas. And Lawrence, Kansas has a population of about 180,000 people, of which a third of those are students at the University of Kansas. So it's a like classic college town. Um, but of the, in, in that 180,000 person town, there were over 1,000 bands, like local music acts that had been put together. So one of the things Lawrence.com had was a band database. It had a database of every single band in Lawrence, and, for each, and it had the members, and it could show you the basis in this one is also in these bands, and, and they had gigs on, it would show you the gigs. It had, it, it had over 1,000 MP3s of tracks by local bands in 2003. 2003, yeah. Because, well, <laughs> actually, because the local newspaper was also owned the local cable company, and there was really good cable internet across Lawrence. <laughs> so it made sense for us to have giant MP3 files for people to, to show access. off that you could do that kind of exactly, stuff. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, Lawrence.com was a classic Django, this the classic kind of website you'd build with Django today. You know, it's uh, very relational. There were things like, if there's an event listed and the event is outdoors, um, it's in the next three days, it would show you the weather pulled in from the weather sites that we also ran because the local newspaper owned the local cable TV and they had a weather site and so all of this stuff linked together and um, so when we were building Django the goal was to be able to rebuild Lawrence.com using this framework so I've, I've always thought it's interesting to compare this to Rails where Rails was extracted from Basecamp they built Basecamp and they pulled Rails out of it Django was it was grown deliberately to build Lawrence.com which already existed in PHP so right. we knew what kind of functions and conveniences we'd need and um, in the end, we, um, so we were building this thing. 
I think our boss didn't really care about the technology. He cared about the results. And he trusted Adrian enormously because he'd built all of this stuff as a one-man band. Right. So when we said, hey, we're going to use a different programming language and we're going to start building stuff differently, he didn't care. You know, he, as, yeah. far, as far as he was concerned, if he got the software that he wanted, then it didn't matter what we were building, um, building it with. And, and how's the reaction to this stuff? Like, like was there a lot of... Um internal pushback, like, it's a new kind of engine, or, um, or did it look very similar to start with? The management was very hands-off. Okay. So, you know, as long as stuff got delivered, they weren't really paying that much attention to our day-to-day. So, you know, right. we must have spent about four months initially without producing anything using this new Python stuff that we were building. We were spending our time arguing about templating syntax on whiteboards and stuff. And in the meantime, we were still pushing things out in PHP and... You know, there, there was visible progress happening. It's just that so it, what they didn't know is that we were spending two thirds of our time on this Python yeah. stuff. It wasn't like a drop the world. It was more like sort of no, exactly. It was it was while we were while we were going along. And then when we started getting results out of it, um, we started being able to turn stuff down incredibly quickly. You know, with the template language and well, there was there was no ORM back then. It was. Um, good lord! At one point, it was code generation. It was kind of I've horrifying. Seen some of that code. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we started being able to turn stuff out really quickly. And in a newspaper environment, that's really important because you, you often want to build things that are tied to a news story of some sort. Mm. Um, the first really big success we had was the, um, it was probably the, the local kids' little league stuff where our boss, who was something of a, he was a real personality. You know, he's since gone, jumped through a whole bunch of other news, like newspapers, like um, the Las Vegas Sun and stuff, um, shaking things up. And this, this was one of his starting points, this little paper. Right. And he said, um, we're going to do the, um, we're going to do kids, kids Little League is on. It's like kids softball and baseball season. And we're going to treat these kids like they're the New York Yankees. We're going to have a site with like team pages and schedules and player interviews. And we even sent interns out to all of the softball pitches with like a camera on a tripod and took 3D videos and like used some flash. Vi- no, it was QuickTime VR. We oh, had God. QuickTime VR of all of the local softball pitches. Wow. Yeah, and so it was completely over the top. And the thing is that that's really good for business because right. what company in a small town in a small town in Kansas doesn't want to sponsor the Little League coverage? And were, were, you, were you getting national coverage for a bit, all this stuff as well? Or was no, it more no, no, no. This was kids aged like five through twelve baseball and softball games. And just there all was a, local. Yeah, all local. There was a newspaper. There was a weekly newspaper like supplement that came out with these kids' photos in. It was. <sighs> But yeah, there was, it was that kind of stuff. So it was, it was kind of fun. Right. So I'm curious, like, you said there was no RM, but like, how much did that first version of the CMS resemble modern Django? Let's give it 1.0. So some things, the, the template language is, was pretty much as shipped. Mm-hmm. The request response cycle stuff and the URL handlings were as shipped. Like, the URLs thing, we, we said, OK, we'll, we'll do the first version just with some regular expression patterns, and then we'll come up with something faster. And then we benchmarked it, and it turns out that it was fine, and now we're, what, like nearly 10 years later, and it's still mostly fine. Yeah. I've noticed that the, um, the Node.js community now has a like, tree-based URL routing thing written in C that they have bindings for. So they, they clearly finally decided that they'd solve the URL matching performance it's problem. It's never truly solved, I suspect, yeah. but it's one of those um, things. But yeah, so there was a lot of stuff like that. The ORM, um, the ORM was ori- originally we'd copy and paste these sort of model definitions and we'd mutter to each other, this is pretty repetitive. I've written this code before. And then I went away on, um, I think I went away to South by Southwest for four days. And when I came back, Adrian had written a code generator that g- generated ORM pages and even had an early version of the admin that was code generating as well. Oh, okay. So that was a leave Adrian alone for, for a weekend and... and it's dangerous business leading. Exactly, right? yeah. yeah. And so it was um, like, you know, the admin did, I assume, didn't look like it does now. Um, it, it? it looked pretty. It looked reasonably similar. Bear in okay. mind that the designer of the original admin, Wilson Miner, yeah, who Wilson then Miner. went on to work at Facebook and RDO and um, Apple and all sorts. Of, a, a, the Lawrence Journal world has an interesting thing in that if you go and work for this paper, at least it certainly used to be true that your next job will be somewhere really big. Like, Adrian went on to the Washington Post. Um, we had interns who went on to the Pointer Journalism Institute. We had Wilson who went off to Apple afterwards. It was right. a sort of huge stepping stone for, for bigger things afterwards. Um, but anyway, yeah, he'd built the first version of the admin. I think he reskinned it for the open source one, but it was fundamentally okay. the, the same so as it looks very similar. Yeah. 
And so, and so like, you know, of the things between that initial release and Django 1.0, like, what do you think was the biggest improvement over the series? Um, the two big ones. So I'm pretty sure middleware was something that Jacob came up with right. um, before that. But all, the biggest one was moving from code generation to meta classes for the ORM. And that was driven by Ian Bicking, didn't write the code, but he sat down with Adrian, I think, at a Python conference and explained how meta classes work. And uh, uh, was, he had SQL object at the time. Yes, which I remember using um, at the time. Yeah, yeah. and so, so, so Adrian rebuilt um, that the, the initial version of the Django ORM became meta classes rather than code generation. So it's no surprise that it's very similar, SQL objects are very similar to the ORM then, that they are, they are the same kind of lineage. Exactly, yeah, they were, they were, they, they, there was a very clear inspiration Interesting. there. And, and so like, you know, in the general idea, like, what was that process going from this being an internal CMS to being an open source product? Like, how so did that flow? So I wasn't there for that. So I left, um, I left after my 12 months were up. Right. And back then, it was still called the CMS. We'd been desperately trying to find a name for it. The best name, the best option we had was calling it the Tornado Publishing System <laughs> because we were big fans of Office Space and we thought we could have it generate TPS reports. Uh, um, but unfortunately, it turns out in Kansas, tornadoes aren't funny. So... <laughs> The, um, the newspaper, the, the, they were like, no, we're, we're not calling this thing Tornado. A very just... prescient name, though, in many senses. Yeah. Because like, the Tornado framework came out Absolutely, yeah. But of course, they didn't build it in Kansas. So they didn't have people saying, True. you know, that's kind of a sensitive area. <laughs> um, so apparently, the, what happened was, um, so the Lawrence Journal World is a ver owned by a very conservative family. Like, I believe George W. Bush stays with the owner of the newspaper when he goes through Kansas, you wow. know. And... Um, so super, super, super conservative uh, family, but they, and so when, the, um, when they wanted to open source Django, they went to the owner of the paper and said, look, um, we've got this thing, and it's kind of like this Rails thing, which is taking off like crazy. Um, and, you know, the company that built Rails, they open sourced it, and as a result, they've been able to hire people, and they've had all of these, like, uh, people outside the company are fixing their bugs, and they've had all of these benefits. And the owner, the owner said, oh, that's interesting. And then they said, and also, we built all of this, the, the stuff at the company on open source software. You know, the Lawrence Journal world is built on Python and Linux and Postgres and all of these open source things. And we feel we should give back to the community. And that was the argument that worked. Really? You know, I think the, the Basecamp example was nice. But the, um, they were like, yeah, that completely makes sense. It's, yeah, we, we give back, we, we, it's about time we gave back to this community that supported us with software. I, I guess also like in rural communities like that, that's kind of almost a... I guess so, thing, yeah. Right? I mean, it's a very philanthropic newspaper. The, um, I believe the money in the newspaper was from... They built a giant cable network in the 70s across like three states and then sold... And everyone thought they were insane. Why would you... <laughs> lay fiber optic cables and then they sold it to Comcast or someone and retired to Lawrence, Kansas where they maintained their, their ownership of that one bit of the cable network and bought up the local paper and became this little media conglomerate with, uh, for a population of 100,000 people. Right. Uh, so, like, you know, after you came back to the UK, um, after the LJ World, like, did you keep involved in January at that point? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was great for me because there was all of this code that I'd wanted to, like, I think I'd, I'd I'd gone back to like hacking on bits and pieces at university in PHP because I didn't have any of this right. Python code to, to work with anymore. Because it was still like, and, and actually, source. no, I built I built one project on Rails because Rails was open source, and I was like, wow, yeah. this is kind of like that, like the Python thing that we had. So when Django was open sourced, it was fantastic because I suddenly had access to this code again, and yeah, I've been building building stuff mostly with Django ever since. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So we've got a bit of time for questions now. So if any questions from the audience want to come down, and take some from the mics. Um, Feel free to queue up. Otherwise, we'll keep going. Any questions? No? Oh, no. Do you have to go for the mic? Just not really about Django, but more the, um, the local um, journalism stuff that you did in Kansas and with Adrian doing every block and stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I don't, doesn't exist anymore, I think. What's your take on this, and do you, do you see any future in this? And because uh, Django, as you said, is really well suited to building stuff. So like that. local journalism mm -hmm. stuff. So um, yeah. So Adrian, after he left the journal world, he went to the Washington Post for a year and a half, and then he broke broke away from that and built Every Block, which was a wonderful thing, which he then sold to um, who was that? Sorry, yeah. MSNBC, um, mm -hmm. and they unfortunately uh, shut it down. Did it come back? It, it has come back. back yeah. yeah. Um, so that was interesting. I mean. The hyper-local thing has always been very difficult for people to build really interesting businesses around. What I think the legacy for Django was much more in data journalism. If you look at 
the big, most of the big papers in the US that are doing data journalism projects are using, quite a lot of them are using Django, and you get these wonderful projects coming out of the Washington Post and the New York Times. When I worked at The Guardian for a couple of years, that was my focus there, was doing database journalism stuff with Django. And a lot of those um, characteristics that, you know, because it came out of a newsroom and it was about being able to turn around production things really quickly, the, the web framework for perfectionists with deadlines, that stuff plays really well into data journalism. And yeah, I'm, I, I think it's been fantastic seeing data journalism just keep on growing as a discipline and people build more and more exciting stuff. Um, before, before I'd done anything with Django, I had this sort of idea that it was something to do with this newspaper in Kansas, which, uh -huh. seemed, which seemed like a very odd idea. And um, I was interested by what you said, that the owner sort of saw it as a philanthropic thing, open sourcing it initially. But I'm not quite sure... Uh, Today, there is uh, the Django Software Foundation. Subsequent to the initial open sourcing, did the newspaper provide resources to do things that weren't, strictly speaking, in its only so for its own That's a very interesting or... question. So I don't know a great deal of the detailed history. I mean, the, the big thing that happened is they open sourced Django. It took off like crazy. It was doing really well with newspapers. They then took the, com the content management system and turned it into a commercial product called Ellington, which they licensed to a whole bunch of other newspapers. So they actually span the, the development team, which were, had been just myself and then Adrian and then Adrian and Jacob. Span, they span that off into a completely separate company, which grew to... They must have had about about a dozen, possibly up to a dozen developers at one point, and that was um, providing that was supporting like Django development and providing commercial support for Ellington and doing custom builds and so forth. And unfortunately, I believe that's um, that's sort of shrunk back down again now. They there were a few years when they were doing really exciting stuff with it, but it's a very tough business, you know, selling software to other newspapers when all of the other newspapers are running out of money is a is a difficult way to to to, to build a business. Uh, and, and if I can just have another question, which is not really related, but I was kind of curious to know what the initial database uh, th that you supported was. It was Postgres. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. we built, we built um, Django, or the CMS, was running entirely on Postgres. The MySQL stuff actually happened after it was open sourced, but within like two weeks or something. <laughs> you know, if you, you can actually go back on the mailing list and see Django was open sourced. Uh, um, and then I think it was mostly Adrian got it working under MySQL. There's this incredible flurry of activity from Adrian for the first year or so after the release. And yeah, MySQL, he, he got it working in a couple of weeks after, after it was open sourced. Oh, right. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, from that point of um, the day of it, that, that it was open sourced, what was the activity like and the response from community? Maybe just sort of tell the story around the next few so months. So again, remembering back, I mean, this was the open sourcing happened in maybe June of two thousand and five, I think, um, and there was this. What's that? Sorry. It was July. July 2005. So there was this complete explosion in activity around it because the Python world really needed a sort of modern web framework. Um, and the, there was a lot of excitement about Django as well from people who'd seen a talk that... I think it wasn't even a talk. Adrian had been informally demoing it to people at PyCon in Washington, D.C., possibly. And there were a bunch of people who got really excited about it and said, you know, if you open source this, we'll, we'll be really interested. But it came out, it was also, this was a few months after Rails had de debuted. So there was a, lot, a big understanding in the Python community that, 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 that Rails was demonstrating that there's a thing that you can build that Python hasn't got yet. So I think that probably helped a lot as well. But yeah, there was just this enormous flurry of activity. There were, I mean, you can go back, go back and look at the mailing list back then, but there were people submitting things, there were suggestions coming in, people were writing um, like their own ad hoc tutorials and so on. And yeah, it's, um, it would be interesting actually just to look at things like the, the number of messages to the Django users mailing list um, would probably be an interest, a, a quite a good sort of illustration of how quickly things took off. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll throw one more just to, to just to tail it off here. Okay. So it's now what ten years later since you started. Eight years since it was open sourced. Yeah. Um, what's the big regret? What did we do badly? What should we have done differently the first time? Or is it all just a, it's all a learning exercise, and we've all ended up in a good place? What did we do wrong? Um, again, I feel like I'm talking for people who put far more work into into it since since my sort of initial contributions. Um, Yeah.
Yeah, I'm totally unprepared to answer that one, actually. <laughs> um, I still think... I, I, a personal pet peeve of mine, I don't like debug equals true versus debug equals false. I think we put far too... And this is a problem that I still don't think we've solved, is we put far too much stuff into global settings. Um, so it would have been fantastic if we'd been a lot less settings oriented from like from day one that you couldn't just import Django you had to do the django.com.configure and all of that kind of stuff and you know I think that's a mistake that we that still hurts us 10 years later um, so that's definitely something that I'd, I'd like us to have, have approached differently oh, excellent. thank you very much Simon thanks a lot